I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank because it's beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, so you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto, and I'm your haunted podcast tour guide. Watch for jump scares. <laughs> I'm Matt Bernico. Uh, I'm your favorite Christian leftist influencer online. That's it. That's, that's true. That's all I'm doing this you, week. You are my favorite Christian leftist influencer online. Yeah, that's right. Um I'm gonna. I need to start selling something. I think to kind of uh, capitalize <laughs> on all that. Yeah, I'm gonna start selling some uh, Christian uh, supplements. Supplements yeah, for cr- Christians. Christian supplements. Some like weird Karl Marx beard care. Um, now that's know. an idea. It is an idea. Karl Marx beard care for dads. Yeah, TM TM TM. If you make it, it's fine. Just uh, pay us residuals. <laughs> Please, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, here we're coming to you uh, live uh, the day after Halloween on November 1st. <laughs> Listen, it's been really spooky for the last few days, but the spookiness doesn't have to end now. And you know what? We're not going to let it. So um, we've been doing some spooky stuff in the past, and we're going to just uh, we're gonna keep being spooky today um, because Halloween is one of the best times of the year next to Christmas, I guess. And uh, we don't want the spookiness to end. So, Dean, what are we going to do in this episode? In this episode... We are going to keep the spook train a rolling. Uh, we so we did not watch another evangelical movie, so you're welcome, all of you. Uh, however, what we did do is we went through a bunch of uh, spooky things in Karl Marx's work. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but Marx is really fascinating. You know him from all your faves, like uh, political economy and weird investigations of how much uh, coats cost. Or did you know <laughs> he also has a lot to say about vampires and werewolves and ghosts and monsters? Probably not. Maybe he did, but uh, maybe not. And we're going to go into it. Uh, we found some stuff. We also found some really uh, fun lore about uh, Vladimir Lenin, some spooky occultic lore. So this is kind of just a grab bag, a trick-or-treat bag, if you will, of spooky themes in Marxism and, uh, to a lesser extent, Leninism. Uh, but before we do that, Matt, I did myself uh, go through the Haunted Minds of Reddit uh, this week. And I've got some some gems for you. Oh, great. All right. Mm-hmm. Um Trick or treat, we'll find out which one these questions are. The first I'm going to put to you is, I live in a haunted house with friendly ghosts. Doesn't this show that spirits do stay on Uh Earth for a while, unlike Christian belief? So the real subtext here is, if you live in a house with friendly ghosts, um, doesn't that disprove all of Christianity? Because the ghosts are on Earth and not in heaven. Is that the, that's the thing? Hmm. Yeah. No, I guess it does. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's it a quick one. It. Let me give you a few uh, complications here, just in the uh, in the comments. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Me so a curveball, you know, please. many people are saying whatever. Ghosts aren't real, or ghosts are secretly demons. That's all kinds of uh, stuff you might expect. Um, but here is my favorite one. Someone says, "I've not studied it, but some pastors I respect have said that there are familiar spirits, aka demons, who spent a lot of time around a now dead person who can answer for them." This is how some seances work, those which aren't run by charlatans. They're not friendly. Just because they aren't physically harming you at this time doesn't make them friendly. In fact, if I were a demon masquerading as a ghost, I might try to pass myself off as friendly to convince you to listen and befriend me, and then I could corrupt you. 
that makes a lot of sense. Ghosts are always just fake, right? They're always just fake ghosts. They're they're not your real they're not your real ghost friends. They're always fake ghost friends to you. They're pretending they're nice. They're not really nice. I get that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, here's yeah, that's why they have those sheets. Yeah, of course. Um, here's my my thought though. Um, okay, the assumption here is that ghosts are dead people, um, mm-hmm. and I guess that's a theory. But what if ghosts aren't people that are dead they're like animals that are dead do you ever think about that because they don't go to heaven obviously um that's true so it's just like 10 dead chipmunks in a bed sheet yeah that's basically what i'm saying here it's like um it's all of the mice that anyone has ever killed and they have kind of um formed a a very delusian type of uh (laughs) being spectral being that is definitely uh functioning as one uh entity so a thought that's pretty good and very it's more horrifying than when I thought ghosts were so congrats. it is scarier yeah um, you know there's this um in in the uh, grand world of paranormal investigation though there's this um there's this like theory about <laughs> so this, this took a real weird turn um there's a theory <laughs> about talking to ghosts called instrumental transcommunication um <laughs> uh, I've done a little bit of academic research on this one. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the theory, though, is that um, there are ways to communicate with spirits back and forth. But the really interesting thing is that in the uh, in, in the positing of this theory, they are very scientific about it. And they make sure to say that, well, maybe ghosts aren't um, just dead people. Maybe there are other types of energy beings out there that we just don't know about. And maybe that's it. Maybe they're like an alien energy being and they're not ghosts at all. Or they're chipmunks in a big sheet. Who knows? Chipmunks and she, aliens or demons. Uh, I do want to say the original poster here in response to that uh, that opinion delivered to us uh, by way of this other um, redditor who says some pastors they respect gave them this uh, this idea about familiar right. spirits. The original poster says this is actually a very good hypothesis and does a good job of explaining some ghostly phenomena. That said, it's just a hypothesis and we can't know for sure. So the familiar spirits in this case, though, they're not dead people at all. They're just spirits. They're demons who spent a lot of time around a now dead person who can answer for them. So they're like, (laughs) they're demons that follow you around your whole life. They get to know you. They know your mannerisms. They know (laughs) your favorite food. They know what brand of peanut butter you like. And so when you get into a seance uh, and you ask about, you know, whether or not your uh, your dead aunt is like, you know, really into uh, reruns in the afterlife or something, um, this demon would know because they watched a lot of TV with your Okay, aunt. so the, the the theory here is that you're having a seance with your friends. All the lights are off. You've lit yeah. some candles. You're holding hands. You're like, are there any spirits here we can talk to? And this demon right. who knows your dead relative is there. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. okay, uh, is my friend Jeremy okay in the afterlife? And then the spirit goes, the demon goes and asks your friend Jeremy if they're okay? No, no. No, the Jeremy is long gone. The demon just knows Jeremy so well, having spent a lot of time around Jeremy while Jeremy was alive, that the demon uh, answers in the guise of Jeremy. I see. So if you were like, yeah, if you if you said, you know, Jeremy, where did you hide that uh, twenty dollars that you owe me? The demon uh, the would. The demon know. could be like, yeah, the demon as Jeremy pretending to be Jeremy would be like, oh, it's in you know my old my old gross coat that nobody ever wanted to touch and that's why he didn't find the $20 yeah. so the demon is a false Jeremy I don't like that that's um, right I get it that's a that is a theory for sure it's just a hypothesis and we can't know for sure it's a hypothesis just like the chipmunks and also like the uh just the energy beings you know they're all just hypotheses um you know <laughs> some are from uh scientists some are from respected pastors who can say some of them are from podcasters us <laughs> and who can really say? They're, That's right. They're all equally as good, I think. Yeah, and listen, uh, listeners, a that is a definitive um, claim because Matt is a, a resident expert on ghosts and uh, paranormal activity and all that kind of thing, um, so you can trust his opinion. We haven't talked about that in this podcast for a long time, but uh, Matt moonlights as a scholar of the paranormal, in, um, and that is not a joke. In a, but like not in a not in a weird way, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. In a weird way, but not the weird way that you're thinking. Not the weirdest way. Not like the I'm like Dr. Van Helsing kind of way, but in the uh, right, right. I, I wrote a paper about this once kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just like Dr. Van Helsing. All right. <laughs> he never uh, presented at any conferences, is... and it's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> here's another one. Um, related, but somewhat different. Okay. Um, if Jesus walked into the most haunted places in your country, what do you think would happen? Yeah. Would the spirits or demons reveal themselves? What do you think would happen? Okay. 
I like that they've asked, what do you think would happen two times? So first, Dean, I need, mm-hmm. I need some context here. What is the most haunted place in, the, in my country? Oof. Uh, again, you're the expert here, but I'm just uh, uh, going off of my own, um, yeah. you know, knowledge of the History Channel. Uh, I'm thinking prisons, asylums, uh, anywhere that they collected spooky people in real life. That's where you're going to find spooky people after. Okay, that makes sense. Well, not not that people in asylums and uh, prisons are spooky. No. It's that the uh, the guards in those places are spooky. <laughs> That's right. The structures of power, uh, they're spooky. All cops are spooky is one of Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, so I live um, in Illinois, and uh, you probably don't know this, and probably most of our listeners don't know this either, but Illinois is home to the most haunted town in the United States. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a, it's a little place called Alton, Illinois. It's uh, really close to St. Louis, but it's in Illinois still. And it's the most haunted city. I don't know. I don't know why, but it is for sure. Anyways, one time my wife and I uh, were on a date in Alton, Illinois, and we went to a pizza restaurant. And uh, the back of the menu in the pizza restaurant said, "Hey, this re- this restaurant's haunted, and you might see a ghost." <laughs> and it gave it gave us all the lore about the ghosts that were in this restaurant. And like, there's this little boy that plays by the stairs, and there's this guy that walks around upstairs, and there's this woman who sometimes you see in the bathroom, and that was all really disconcerting to us. Um, and uh, I think so. Okay. So this is maybe how I'm interpreting the question. What would you, what would happen if Jesus walked into the most haunted places in your country and Alton, Illinois is definitely one of the most haunted places in the country. And okay. the yep. only place he sat down for dinner at that place. Yeah. He's having dinner in this pizza place. I think that what would happen is, um, I mean, I guess the demons and the ghosts and the familiar spirits would all have to come out, right? Because they'd be like, Jesus, he's here. We can't remain. And it would be a big mess, though. Because, like, think of all the ghosts coming out every which way. It's so haunted. It's so full of ghosts. Like, they're coming out of the woodwork. And then, like, where are they going to go? Because they can't just sort of inhabit the space if Jesus is there. Yeah. Um, are they... It's a lot of ectoplasm. There's probably not a lot of pig farms. No, there's probably not a lot of pig farms. Um, but like the pizza would be ruined. That's for sure. Because the ghosts would get in there. <laughs> the ectoplasm would get in there. And that's the story of how Jesus might ruin a very nice night eating pizza. <laughs> uh, well, uh, one once more, um, just a voice from the comments. Uh, this This comment says, the bigger question is whether one believes in such things. I do not. I do believe in spiritual forces in the world, but I believe they are manifested in the mind and in the soul. Okay. Christ cast out demons, so I suppose that would happen. And this is an important question or important re- reply because the poster says, this just changed my entire perspective on things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's my favorite thing, that this like pithy comment that everyone already thinks uh, is changed your entire ex- experience, your entire worldview. <laughs> You know, uh, as a scholar of the paranormal, um, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't think a lot of people actually believe in ghosts, but whether or not you, you do believe in them or don't, you should just pretend like you do because, um, it'd be so much more fun to just do that. (laughs) You could definitely write cooler menus at pizza place. Yeah. I mean, ghost stories are really fun. Like, why would you... (sighs) you don't you know you're sitting around the campfire with your friends you're telling some spooky stories and you know your friends like yeah and then at my grandma's house there's this ghost and the ghost sits on her bed at night or something and and you don't ever want to be the person that's just like oh but ghosts aren't real it's like shut up (laughs) shut up chet crunksworth you're not a person that i want to hear from just just play with people in that space and talk about the ghost it's so fun who cares? Yeah, yeah. Or talk about what uh, some pastors you really respect suggested about those. See, ghosts. and that makes sense to me. I mean, the question of whether ghosts exist or not is like, I don't even care. Um, they they probably don't, and I don't care. And I would never, I would never ruin someone's awesome ghost story by saying I don't think they exist. Ugh, people. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this is a great segue into the third of four questions I have for you. So we're oh my going, God. we're halfway through. Okay. I know. I've got you in the hot seat. Um, we're helping so many people. I know. <laughs> question three. Are vampires a thing in Christianity? That's the first part of the question. Second is, do they exist? Huh. And then uh, the question says, which has existed, apparently? I'm watching Twilight right now, and I feel like it's 2008 again. And this is from 17 days ago, so it feels like a decade ago. Yeah. 
I wish it was 2008 again. What a what a what a more pure time that was. <laughs> <laughs> Hope and change. We're on the way. And vampires. We're everywhere. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll, I'll read it all back to you. Please, uh, yeah. Are vampires a thing in Christianity? Uh-huh. Do they exist? Witches exist, apparently. I'm watching Twilight right now, and I feel like it's 2008. The the sentence, witches exist, apparently, is so upsetting to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, people are witches. What are you going to do about it? Of course they exist. Like, come on. Uh, but so they do exist. Not apparently. Factually, witches are, witches are people who are real. Whether or not you believe in witchcraft is another story. But again, like, don't rain on someone else's parade because you don't believe in it. It's fine. <laughs> um, unless it's, like, bad for some reason. I don't know. I'm not going to say that definitively, but do vampires exist? Because witches do, apparently. Um, yeah, I'm going to say they do. They're probably real. But whether vampirism is like, you know, whether it's a, a real thing, whether it's a thing that you can contract because someone's bitten you, it's another question. But vampires definitely exist. People think they're vampires. Yeah. Um, someone does say in here, no, they're not real, but it would be pretty dope if they did exist. Now, so that's kind of splitting the difference. It here. is. Yeah. But I mean, people think people people identify as vampires for one reason or another and like let them have their thing. <laughs> All right. There you go. The Matt, Matt Bernico hot take. Just like let um, people be vampires if they want to be. I don't know what the, what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> the judgment is in. I mean, uh, I drink blood every Sunday at a uh, church. So I eat basically the haunted bread and it's fine. <laughs> uh all right the last one here is related to the last couple of episodes we've done think of this as the the bridge question uh-huh. um because it does have to do with the rapture okay and i'm gonna do a little paraphrasing because this is a long one uh, but it is so worth it <clears throat> here it goes the title is i am thinking the alien and zombie movement are the devil's attempt to prepare the world for the second coming of christ uh-huh. that's what they are thinking and here it goes I've been thinking about this for some time, but over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a great deal of discussion on talk radio, TV, and the internet about aliens, supposed abductions, government conspiracies, etc. There also has been, over the last five years, an incredible amount of interest and talk about zombies. I've never really understood why these things were popular in the public mind. I mean, how many aliens are running around? There are probably just as many stories as those who claim to see an angel. I also have not seen a zombie running around, although some people are as scary as zombies. <laughs> I have some ideas that I think may give some answers from a spiritual perspective, at least. As Christians, we know the second coming of Christ is clear or near. We believe it as a literal reality. He'll descend from the sky with hosts of heaven and bring peace to the world for a thousand years. The scriptures also teach that the righteous will receive their bodies again and come alive in the resurrection of the same as Christ. And here's the kicker. I'm becoming more and more convinced that as the devil has an alternate plan, he wants people to believe the second coming is an alien invasion and the resurrection a zombie attack of the dead. What could suit his purposes more than to try and get people to not believe even when Christ comes? This question has got so many twists and turns. So like, I, it really does. So on the one hand, like, um, okay. What this reminds me of so much is, in the uh in people who are into ufos they believe in this thing called like a soft disclosure that like uh the government is like slowly letting people know that aliens exist so like the soft disclosures that like they let people know that they exist so that um that people don't freak out all at once like in independence day that movie with will smith right, right. um but in this one it's kind of like a reverse soft disclosure where the devil is trying to get you to believe they exist so that when Jesus comes back, you're like, oh, no, zombies. Now, that's an interesting strategy, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, and aliens also it's aliens and aliens zombies. and zombies. Um, we could probably, I mean, throw some th- other stuff in there, too, I, I imagine. But yeah, I mean, I think that if the devil was going to do that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I would actually love that as a left behind movie. Um, it, it's like, uh, <laughs> that's like left behind, but like, it's, instead of Nikolai Carpathia, uh, being like the leader of the UN, it's like the antichrist is just like a brand manager and he's just trying to disrupt the brand of, uh, <laughs> of the rapture. It's like, Oh, the rapture. No, no, no. It's not God coming back. It's like zombies and aliens and stuff. Ooh, so scary. And, uh, it's just like, it's just like, uh, the devil as ad executive and he's, um, going to mad men. Uh, just madman the shit out of that one and get everyone to believe uh, yeah, God yeah. is a zombie. So pretty good. 
Yeah, I think that's a great strategy. I think it's a great uh, that's a great movie idea. I would definitely uh, fund that on Kickstarter. So, uh, well, I wouldn't because Kickstarter uh, are anti union people, and I don't like them. But um, but you know what I mean. Like I would definitely crowdfund that idea. <laughs> I do. I do. Yep. So uh, just remember, the next time you think you see a UFO, um, that's Jesus Christ coming back. And uh, the next time you see a zombie running around, don't worry, it's not a zombie. It's just someone who rose from the dead in a holy way. <laughs> don't behead them. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> they don't want your brains. That's a lie from the devil. They just want you to be holy. This is <laughs> this is like the, the zombie, big zombie uh, corporation in America really trying to get people's brains, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, Matt, thank you for indulging these uh, very important questions. I just figured I shouldn't let Halloween go by without asking our residential uh, uh, expert on all things occult and crypto zoological about uh, these very present questions. Yeah, no, anytime. Um, thank you. Uh, all right. Let's talk, though, about what this podcast is actually about, which is Marxism, socialism, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, and spirituality <laughs> that's the tangential subtext of this episode um all right so like i said earlier there's a ton of really wild and really fun uh references to spooky themes in marx's literature and we can get into it uh in a moment here but to set the stage i do want to pull out a quote from a, a really fascinating book called marx's inferno the political theory of capital uh, by William Clare Roberts. It's a fantastic book. You should check it out if you're really into nerdy arguments about um, Marxist political theory. That's kind of what, it, what it's doing. Uh, but he has this great point in the beginning where he says this. When socialists and communists, including Marx, call capital a vampire, they do so because the metaphor seems to them an apt one. And the aptitude of the metaphor can be discussed and articulated in language that is not itself merely an elaboration of the metaphor. The sense that capital is parasitical on, on something, labor, that is both more primary to human existence and more natural and lively than is capital can be spelled out. So what Roberts is saying here is, uh, all right, it's fun to say that capital is like a vampire, and that's true. Uh, but it's not just fun. Like, the metaphor is there because it's actually doing some work. And Marx has a real uh, literary flair in his writing. Uh, he, like, read a ton of literature himself. Um, he read a bunch of Dante. He read a bunch of Shakespeare. He read a bunch of uh, poetry and all that kind of thing. And that makes its way in. But it's not just kind of, uh, you know, flowery prose or, like, just kind of dressing it up or putting ornaments on, on the argument. It's like these are metaphors that Marx thinks are good and important because they actually tell you something interesting about capitalism. Uh, so we're going to go through a few of those metaphors on this episode. How does that sound, Matt? It sounds so good. Um, uh, yeah, so what we've done here is we've um, we've kind of gone through mostly capital because that's where a lot of these come out, but also the manifesto in a few occasions, and um, I don't know a few a few different pieces of Marx's writing, German ideology, Grundrisse, etc., 18th Brumaire, um, <laughs> which is like my least favorite Marx text, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> it's great, but not very fun to read. Uh, anyway, so we've we've compiled like a bunch of places where Marx talks about uh, vampires, werewolves. Uh, monsters and uh ghosts even yeah ghosts the other one sorry yeah we went through and we just kind of compiled a bunch of things where marx uses these spooky guys uh and gals and non-binary monsters as um <laughs> as um you know a metaphor for explaining what capitalism is like and i think that we, what we want to do here is kind of just follow roberts along and see um you know, take a look at them as like functional metaphors beyond just like um you know like flowery literary language or something so let's just let's just dive in here with probably like one of the most well-known things this is the one where robert starts off with and this is one we're going to start off with too so uh in chapter or sorry in capital volume one chapter 10 which is a good one um mark says dead labor that vampire like only lives sucking living labor and lives the more labor it sucks so in this one uh capital is a vampire sucking labor off like, uh, you know, leeching labor off of workers. And uh, Roberts basically says that, like, this is a really important metaphor, not because it's just, like, compares capitalism to a vampire, but because it describes the way that capitalism actually works, that it only functions off of, like, um, pa parasitically off the, the labor of workers um, and not kind of returning to them, you know, what, what is owed, actually. Yeah, uh, it's a great metaphor because it's suggestive in terms of imagery, but... 
Yeah, it's that idea, too, that vampires, um, you know, they're these kind of corrupt uh, beings. And there's a sort of um, interesting way that Marx is trading off of how vampires belong to, like, aristocracy, usually, in past legends, you know, like Count Dracula and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but Marx is actually turning them into, like, a symbol for the bourgeoisie, which is really fascinating. Um, and so the the premise is that vampires only live, and in fact, they live even more as long as they get the blood from living beings. So they're not self-sufficient. Um, they are monstrous, and they're coming to get you. They're coming to suck out your lifeblood, the thing that, you know, makes you able to, to lead a good life and, and live so that they can sustain themselves. Um, and I think that's a really... Uh, good metaphor in that it's not just a good image that's provocative, but it really does, like we said earlier, tell you something about how capital operates. Yeah, and I think the the metaphor of blood is really important too. I mean, for obvious yeah. reasons, right? It's blood is a like literally is like a representation of vitality and power and like the thing that makes people move and you know alive and humans. <laughs> I'm like squirming around yeah. as I think about blood. Um, but like, uh, what's really important here too is that. Uh, capital sucks the blood from people that thing that makes them actually work and takes it and like leaves the rest of their body behind right it's like um after it's after it takes that like vital force from you it, you don't get anything in return you're just kind of like a dried out husk of a person um and that's kind of like a pretty good i mean that that kind of furthers the metaphor though that like um capital is not interested in your body and your bodily needs and like your body's maintenance but it is interested in your labor power so at every turn it's going to try to find ways to suck the labor power out of you while leaving the rest of you behind yeah that's right i mean it fits really well with uh, another quote about blood that comes up in capital where marx says more than any other mode of production capitalist production squanders human lives or living labor and not only blood and flesh, but also nerve and brain. Uh, this is a, it's a good um, subtle zombie reference there. Uh, I don't think uh, zombies were quite as developed <laughs> in Marx's day, but uh, it works now, piling on the Halloween metaphors here. <laughs> um, but yes, this idea of, uh, you know, it takes your living labor and not only blood and flesh, but also nerve and brain, your, your whole self, everything that makes you uh, able to enjoy a human life, live a full human life. Um, it's turning you into a, you know, a husk of a human person so that it can take all that uh living stuff out of you yeah yeah absolutely and it doesn't want your brain it doesn't it doesn't need you it doesn't need your feedback on how you think things could like work better or whatever it just needs <laughs> your dang body to do the th same thing over and over again yeah. yeah um so we'll probably come back to some more stuff uh vampire like soon but i just want to introduce another monster um the vampire stuff gets a lot of play and we are gonna i'm just looking down the list here there is a another at least one more vampire metaphor but i just want to introduce this one monster that i love which is the werewolf uh everybody knows marx talks about vampires but not everybody knows he talks about werewolves um which is funny because it's also in capital chapter 10, the same place that the first vampire thing we talked about. Um, that's where this shows up. So Mark says in its blind, unrestrainable passion, it's werewolf hunger for surplus labor. Capital oversteps, not only the moral, but even the merely physical maximum bounds of the working day. Yeah. So uh, werewolf werewolves get hungry, I guess. Yeah, I think so the the, um, the opera like the way that this metaphor operates though is that like werewolves. I mean, okay, so vampires they're like um, you know a more um, as as monsters go a bit more genteel, right? They're not going to just like mm -hmm. uh, rip your throat out. But a werewolf they they're like hungry. They're like bounding all over the place. They're unstoppable. They cross every boundary, the boundary of you know the the creature itself. You know, crossing the boundaries of human and animal. And how that's kind of you know uh, transgression, but uh, capitalism is just like a werewolf because it uh, transgresses everything, uh, oversteps not only the moral bounds but also the physical bounds of a of a working day. Um, capitalism is something that like doesn't know any boundaries. It can't be stopped by something. It can't be contained in an area. Um, you know, whatever moral things you might think are like immovable and unquestionable givens can be easily consumed by capitalism, and they'll sell it right back to you. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that idea of like insatiability, like it can't really be, you know, finished until I guess the mood is over. The mood of capital has <laughs> subsided. That's right. Um, yeah, I like that, though, that it's uh, the bounds of the working day. Um, so maybe to just kind of explain some of the political economy that's going on there, the political theory, um, you know, Marx is, is talking about how uh, capital is this 
series of relationships, right? Like some people think capitalism is just like a frozen economic theory full of rules. But what's great about Marx is that he actually thinks it's this this series of processes that are always changing and evolving and all that kind of thing. And what that means is that it has to overstep these kinds of, of boundaries, moral boundaries and physical boundaries, because that's how you keep accruing more and more capital. So, I mean, if you've ever like worked a crappy job and probably most of you have, you know, you know what this is like, like you're sitting at work and it's time to go home and your boss is like, can you stay late? And obviously you can't, but you're basically compelled to do so. Um, or, you know, you feel sort of obligated to do it, even though you shouldn't. Um, and there's all kinds of ways that uh, bosses try to extract all the labor they possibly can just so that they can, you know, make a bigger bottom line at the end of it. Uh, and that idea that capital is this process that's always uh, not abiding those limits, but finding new ways to circumvent them, and it's never really finished. You know, there will never be a boundary that you can set that will finally be respected by capital. Uh, it's always going to be trying to, you know, overcome those boundaries. And I think that's a a good point that Marx makes that some of us often forget. Yeah, you know, when I read this bit about the werewolf too, I thought of another uh, another philosopher. Uh, another pair of philosophers who aren't so thrilled about capitalism either with a way different kind of metaphor for this, but so, still similar in like the kind of idea behind it. But uh, in Deleuze and Guattari's book, Anti-Oedipus, they talk a lot about capitalism. Um, I, again, uh, you know, Marx is one thing, but I would not suggest reading Deleuze and Guattari unless you're a philosophy person and you like that kind of thing. But <laughs> um, anyways, in Anti-Oedipus, they talk about capitalism as this, there's like this technical term they come up with called a body without organs. But what, what that basically means is that it's like uh, capitalism is this kind of thing that exists that's super flexible and kind of can like um, reproduce itself and keep itself going and kind of like acquire new, um, you know, new bits to put into itself to kind of keep itself moving. But they kind of talk about it as like it's a zombie. Um, it's kind of the feeling that you get. It's like this thing that kind of shambles around and it doesn't actually need like a person to control it. It doesn't need like a, you know, a group of CEOs at the top. Uh, capitalism is the kind of thing that is just like reproducing itself and kind of bigger than people um, because of the ways that it is reproducing itself. Um, anyway, so it's like zombie like uh, and werewolf like in that it just can kind of like uh, it finds new like, you know, new machines, new morals, new social structures, and they can, you know, subsume them and keep moving and keep reproducing. Yeah, well, uh, I think it's probably dangerous to make too much of a link between the body with our organs and this quote from Marx, but I'm going to make the suggestive link anyway, because it is a good segue. Sure. Um, yeah, one of my favorite quotes in Capital, actually, is uh, this one, where Marx says, um, he's talking about Capital as a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories and whose demon power, at first veiled <laughs> under the slow and measured motions of his giant limbs, at length breaks out into the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's a good one. A big mechanical monster is something, huh? Yeah, a big mechanical monster with demon power. Uh, man, capitalism is very spooky. There are a few other uh, nice like occult metaphors, and I want to pull another one out. Um, not so much about monsters, but spooky nonetheless. This is from the Communist Manifesto, and it's a, a good one where Marx and Engels write, Modern bourgeois society, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and exchange, is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. Uh, I like that one. Um, it's like in Fantasia when Mickey Mouse has made too many uh, brooms and he's in big trouble. That's what capitalism is. That's right. And the sorcerer has no control over those things. I think that's like the most jacked up thing about capitalism, though, is that like there is it is totally like the case that um, capitalism is, uh, you know, they're, it's material conditions. It's people reproducing these systems. But I think like the crazy thing is that ideology is so strong that people don't even know that they're doing that. You know, you don't even know that you're reproducing right. these systems and you didn't. And, and now you don't even know how to stop them if you wanted to. Um, yeah. without convincing a lot of people to uh, break away from them. And I think that is always the, one of the most troubling ideas in Marx um, for me, that it's just like, uh, you know, a genie you can't put back in a lamp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what a great metaphor, too, for things like climate change and the destructive powers of imperialism and things like that. You know, 
uh, bourgeois society is this thing that brought brought into all these brought into being all these forces that it couldn't really understand because it thought they were going to be useful. Um, the Mickey Mouse thing is kind of a, a goofy metaphor, but it works um, if you haven't seen Fantasia. I guess uh, the it, it's a, the Sorcerer's Apprentice is this old parable, and it's what Marx is drawing off of too. But it's dramatized in that um, Disney film. But the premise is that Mickey Mouse is like left to his own devices, and uh, he wants to be a big famous sorcerer, um, or at least like work for the sorcerer that he's working for. And he's too lazy; he doesn't want to go uh, sweep out the the castle or whatever. So he conjures up a broom, and then he conjures up another broom, and then those brooms start conjuring up more brooms themselves, and they keep doing this task, uh, which is like grabbing a pail of water um, and putting it somewhere else over and over and over again until Mickey Mouse is uh, drowning, and um, it's a it's a good metaphor because it's like capitalism tries to solve these little problems that it has to solve because of all these other things we've been talking about, right? It's insatiable appetite, it's need for more labor, all these kinds of things. Um, but it comes to these breaking points where eventually capitalism falls in on itself even, and it creates these crises uh, that will inevitably continue to keep happening within capitalism because uh, it brings about these these forces that are too big for any one person to really get a handle on or a grasp on and turn it in some direction or another. Yeah, and I think, though, the troubling thing about that idea... I mean, we can, there's another good quote about that we can read in a minute. But the troubling thing about that idea is that um, capitalism, though, I mean, so it's supposed to kind of fall in on itself, right? There are just too many brooms with too many buckets of water or something out there. But still, like, <laughs> capitalism figures out ways to, like, you know, not not do that, right? It, it completely will it'll, it'll decimate people's lives just the same. It will, like, um, enact a, a climate apocalypse upon us. Uh, but still, at the same time, we, we've, we can't get away from it. The, the, gra- the grave has been dug, but no one can push that, push that, uh, that sorcerer in there, the, all the magic in there. It can't go back in the box. Well, um, maybe I'll just read the next one because I've kind of already tipped, tipped my hand. Yeah, so also from, from the manifesto, kind of uh, along the lines of what Dean was saying, though, Marx says, uh, what the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. This is a really troubling part of Marx because I want it to be true very badly, um, but it hasn't mm-hmm. been true yet, um, or at least not in a way that's been sustainable. Um, sustainable in the sense in which like it's still exists in my country or something um, yeah not not globally effective. yeah totally yeah it's not globally effective is is right that's the, probably the better way to say it but yeah this is this is marx's thought that like inevitably capitalism will just keep like growing so much that it can't do anything else and it will collapse in on itself right it's created its own grave diggers um and you know you can take this a, in, a, in a few different ways right it, it can you can take it in the sense that like um capitalism creates its own g- grave diggers in that it produces a really disaffected and alienated working class who can turn against it um or you can take it in the sort of big economic sense where there's just like nothing left for capitalism to do but collapse in on itself because it's so massive and disorganized and crazy um but anyways um that would be nice if it was true globally but not yet yeah Uh, Well, there's another good quote in uh, the German ideology that pulls these last two things together, both the the gravedigger piece and the sorcerer piece. And Marx says this, Hitherto, humans have constantly made up for themselves false conceptions about themselves. The phantoms of their own brains have got out of their hands. They, the creators, have bowed down before their creations. Let us liberate them from the chimeras, the ideas, dogmas, imaginary beings under the yoke of which they are pining away. Uh, and I like that quote a lot because it sets a uh, communist up to be like, um, I don't know, uh, monster hunters or something. Ghostbusters. Is really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Ghostbusters. Exactly. Like I'm, I'm in, but again, I'm going to tell Marx, you got to let people have their ghost stories cause they're very fun. So well, he's, he's got one, you know, the spirit of communism is haunting all of Europe. That's it's the opening the, line of the manifesto. Yeah. So. It's the biggest ghost story. That's a good point. Yeah, the good ghost. The good, the friendly ghost. <laughs> it's actually, uh, it's actually just a spirit that's familiar with communism. <laughs> that's right. That's uh, right. Yeah, that was that's just what a respected pastor told me. So I don't know. <laughs> it must be true. It must be. Um, all right, here's a really fun one. I think this is uh, the one I said earlier about the uh, the weird weird monster that Capital is is my favorite, but this is definitely my second favorite, mostly because it's kind of the same. <laughs> yeah. But it's in uh, the Grundrisse. So Marx writes, The combination of this labor appears just as subservient to and led by an alien will and an alien intelligence, having its animating unity elsewhere, 
as its material unity appears subordinate to the objective unity of the machinery of fixed capital, which, as an animated monster, objectifies the scientific idea and is in fact the coordinator. It does not in any way relate to the individual worker as his instrument, but rather he himself exists as an animated individual punctuation mark as its living isolated accessory. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Capitalism mixes all zombies. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had that uh, feeling, read... though, where you like... Um, I, I remember this when I, I when I worked at a grocery store once. Uh, I had this experience where I would definitely would like go into work, punch in, and then like uh, <laughs> six hours would pass, and I'd be like, where where have I been? <laughs> Yeah, what, is totally, that, what have I been totally. doing? This like crazy thing where you just kind of like, I don't know, I guess I'm just going to be stocking shelves and I don't know why and I don't know what's making me do this, but I guess I'm just going to do it. It's crazy. <laughs> Work is so weird. It is crazy. Yeah. Um, I read that there's some interesting evidence. Uh, so we're we're talking about zombies here because I guess that's more of our cultural point of reference. That's the, the story the devil has told for us. Yeah. Um, we're just sucking right up. <laughs> but uh, I read some uh, really interesting articles this week about how I guess this reference to an animated monster, a lot of people think is a reference to Frankenstein. Sure. Um, and I like that, this idea that, uh, you know, it's the, the animation of all these kind of pieces of corpses put together. Uh, uh-huh. That's what Capital is, this kind of big animated monster created by a mad scientist or something. Yeah, it's like, a, well, it's a reverse, uh, it's a reverse body of God, though. It's like, uh, right. you know, the, the body animated by Capital rather than by Christianity or the Holy Spirit or whatever. Yeah, yeah. This idea, too, that it has, uh, as Mark says here, this alien will and alien intelligence. Yeah. Um, you know, I love that as well. Kind of this, uh, like, capitalism has this hive mind um, that also tries to get you into it, like, you know, the Borg or something. Yeah, or, like, um, I don't know. It, it is kind of, it is pretty spooky, though. I mean, like, nobody wants to go to work. Or, I mean, if you do, then you have a cool job and, like, good for you, I guess. But, like, um <laughs> Like work is in so many ways like really uncanny because it's like your body and you're doing it, but like you definitely don't want to and like it's gonna suck and you're just gonna like disassociate for six hours, I guess. And I I don't know. It's so strange. It's such a strange thing, but it is like a really good um it's a really good analogy to say it's an alien will. It's just like this is not my body, this is not what I wanna do, but here I am doing it just the same. Yeah, something else has like sucked you up. Yeah. Um, don't like that. That's too spooky. No, me neither. All right. So I said that the 18th Brumaire was my least favorite Marx, uh, Marxist text text. Um, and I stand by that. It does have that one really good quote first is tragedy, then is farce, but, um, it's a really hard (laughs) piece of writing to read unless you know a lot about Napoleon. Uh, and (laughs) I don't. So anyways, there's one quote from it though, that I think applies to our, our theme that we've kind of been pulling out here. And Marx writes this. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Who <laughs> it's actually a really heavy thought. I love that one. But um yeah. this one this one's about capitalism but in kind of a roundabout way. It's about it's about not just capitalism but everything. That the the traditions of past generations, um, you know, only only the brains of the living do we know kind of like what we've inherited. Only on this side of things do we know like what they have wrought in doing the things they've done. We can see all of the ways that these decisions have lent us all kinds of new horrors, but uh, only we can see them and not them, not the dead folks. Yeah, um, I like it too because it is such a good, helpful quote for Christians. I think um, a lot of Christians like the idea of uh, you know the tradition of all gen- all dead generations uh, is supposed to be sometimes like a a really good um, positive thing, um, and in in some respects it is. You know, like I like the saints and all that kind of thing. Uh, but sometimes traditions become these kind of dead weights that also like pressure you into not thinking um, critically or. Uh, not kind of seeing past your own um, your own present moment. Uh, and that's also something that Marx is getting at in that text, uh, that traditions hold revolutionary movements back because people don't want to get rid of them, even though they might be bad or arbitrary. Yeah. You know, um, there's a... Okay, so Dean, obviously you know who he is, but I'm going to say it for the, for the listeners. But there's this uh, philosopher of media named Wilhelm Flusser, Uh, who he wrote that squid book that Dean and I like so much. And um, he wrote this other book that's called the shape of things. And it's basically like a philosophy of design, like a philosophy of architecture kind of. Um, And in it, he says that um, like design is just like the um, it's the, it's the creation of obstacles by one generation and the removal of obstacles by another generation. 
but like the feeling is that like when you when you make something new in the world like you make it knowing that someone in the future is gonna have to undo it and Lister thinks like that's like the funniest and like most interesting part of design that like whenever you make something you should be thinking about how people are gonna have to dismantle it in the future and i right. wish that the tradition of all the dead generations knew that <laughs> <laughs> please stop <laughs> don't make things like yeah, this that's right <laughs> or don't make it that hard make it make whatever you want but make it easy to undo <laughs> yeah yeah uh unless it's good in which case make it impossible to undo um all right so we're getting close to the end of our marks quotes there are some more out there i'm sure um send them in if you've got some that we missed send them uh but i did promise we'd come back to vampires and i thought this quote might be a little more interesting um but i think we've we've said it but just to deliver on the promise i am going to read it uh so it's from capital And Mark says, the time for which uh, a person is free to sell their labor power is the time for which they are forced to sell it. That, in fact, the vampire will not lose its hold on them so long as there is a muscle, a nerve, or a drop of blood to be exploited. Uh, So, again, just kind of pulling out all that stuff about how vampires are going to suck you up and uh, leave it all, or not leave anything behind. Um, A good metaphor for capital. Yeah. Uh, All right, let's leave uh, Mark's behind briefly and just go to some very fun uh, Lenin lore that we got right uh, that we found online so not only is communism the specter haunting europe but vladimir lenin is the specter haunting russia <laughs> <laughs> so uh in, in doing some of like the research for this kind of digging up the spooky stuff about marx we did find these like very funny ghost stories and also folklore stories about lenin and uh let's just get them out here let's just i you know what what is halloween without a good spooky ghost story um so yeah. I'll tell mine first. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is a quick, uh, a really short story um, that is uh, probably from a dubious website, but who cares? This is, this is titled <laughs> Ghost of Lenin Cited in the Kremlin. The ghost of Vladimir Lenin was first seen at the Kremlin in the small hours of October 19th, 1923. The incident took Ooh. place about three months before the Bolshevist leader passed away. So... They saw the ghost of Lenin before he died. I don't know if that's a ghost. I think that's astral projection, but whatever. In fact, (laughs) Lenin was gravely ill at the time. He stayed within the confines of Gorky, which is a city. Um, His residence outside of Moscow, says Alexander Gorbovsky, a historian and writer. A former courier of the Kremlin dispatch department told me the story by accident. He eavesdropped on a telephone conversation that night. He dropped by the guard's office for a cup of tea. He heard a duty officer asking someone on the phone, can you tell me why Lenin has arrived in the Kremlin on his own? I've just checked the situation. There are no guards whatsoever. Okay, then. I'll call security in the Gorky residence. Then the courier heard the officer making another call. Security at Gorky just confirmed that Lenin hadn't left the residence today. They say he's in Gorky. Yes, they're pretty certain, Ad Gorbovsky. So there we go. We got Lenin. He it's um it's just a bit before he dies. He's very ill. Um he was kind of afflicted with a lot of like physical maladies before his death, but I I know he couldn't really walk. Um so it's like um it's kind of extra spooky that he would show up at the Kremlin as a ghost. But, uh, I mean, Lenin and his big brain, he's just uh, hes just getting his spirit out there. He's just taking a jaunt around the world. He's just seeing the things there are to see. <laughs> that's all. Uh, yeah, really wild guy. Whether or not the story is true doesn't matter because I believe it because I want to. Because it's um, too fun. It's too fun to say, no, that's not true. Oh, it's too good. I know. I agree. Uh, I really like the idea of uh, Lenin being spooky. There's also a bunch of stories that you can find on the internet. Again, the veracity, who knows, but of uh, like Lenin and Stalin haunting uh, the Kremlin. Um, and I like that idea. All these uh, ghosts of communism wandering around really pissed that uh, people took down the Soviet Union. The, that's the unfinished business. They're not going to leave until <laughs> until we get it going. That's right. Uh, I've got one that I found also. Um Again, uh, possibly of dubious origin, but uh, a little more direct um, than a thing on a website uh, from a book called The Werewolf in Lore and Legend by a real life person whose actual name is Montague Summers. It's too it's too um, good of a name to be real, but uh, OK. I know. I, I thought so, too. Uh, I even double checked. I looked it up. He's a real guy, a real British scholar. Um this book was written in 1933. Uh, Montague Summers appears, from my reading, to have been an anti-communist, but nevertheless, uh, this is a great story contained in this book. Um, so he kind of sets it up. 
uh, he sets up the story saying that in Russia, there's all kinds of like were creatures, werewolves, they're shape shifting. Um, there's all kind of wizards whose souls are like stuck in animals, he says, <laughs> which is very funny. That makes sense. Um, yeah, of course. Um, and so there's all kinds of like uh, folklore in Russia is kind of what he's saying. You know, there's all these these legends and, and myths that are still kind of hanging around. But uh, he turns to talk about this, um, how this kind of feeds into um, the Soviet Union. And he says this, among the latest Soviet pro- Soviet propaganda is the utilization of fantastic legends about Le- about Lenin. In Siberia, among the Aborigines, the story runs that Lenin was originally a bear, for the bear is the Siberian totem. The bear Lenin lived for a long time in the virgin forest. There came a Russian general to the forest and tried to trap the bear. He placed a barrel of vodka in the forest, and Lenin, having drunk it, became intoxicated. Thus he fell into the hands of the Russian general who compelled him to wander about all over the world and to dance for him. Finally he escaped, became a man, and now he is revenging himself on all generals. <laughs> so there you go, Lenin the Werebear. Kind of like a it's kind of like a little mermaid story, but uh but it's Lenin, he's a bear and not a mermaid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, part of your world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh i love this the way the story is told is also very funny because it's like hey one time there was a bear the bear got extremely drunk and uh this general got him dragged him around uh and made him made him dance and then that bear just became a human somehow we don't know became a human and then that human uh created a a revolution in russia (laughs) uh just a really a really good story a nice story yeah it's probably for the best probably uh, so there you go, Montague Summers just cataloging some good uh, Soviet folklore. If you know other Soviet folklore, you should send it to us because I think that is my secret new research hobby. Yeah, it's good. It's a good hobby. Oh boy! Well, after talking about all those vampires and monsters and werewolves and Lenin as a bear, I'm so spooked. I know it's a spooky one. Thankfully, that's uh, all the spooks that you have until next October. That's it. We're not going to scare you even once. <laughs> <laughs> all the tricks have been done and now it's just treats from here on out <laughs> cool well we'll be back next week with our usual stuff i think yeah back to the regularly regularly scheduled programming <laughs> yeah well thanks for listening to the magnificast if you like what you heard uh and you definitely did you love these spooky stories we know you do because we do too um, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Magnificast. Um, you can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash The Magnificast. And we got a Facebook group even that um, is underutilized, but that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, if you uh, don't want to do any of those things, uh, you can also just support us by leaving us a nice uh, review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform that you might use. That really helps us out. Um, cool. The intro music is by Amari Armstrong, and the outro music, as always, is by The Illogical Spoon. See you next time. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no damn between us and our Lord.